My name is Ubaid. I'm from the Recruiters Pakistan, and welcome to my podcast, Victory Spectrum. We have with us one of the finest recruiting uh, thought leaders, editors, consultants of all time, Mr. Hang Lee. Let me give a brief introduction. He has obtained MA in Social Anthropology and postgraduate diploma from the University of Saint Andrews, and he has 15 plus years of proven expertise in agency recruitment, recruitment manager. internal head of talent and recruitment trainer he is also the co-founder of award winning online recruiting platform that is workshop uh, workshop.io and currently he is working uh, as a curator for recruiting brainfood the one of the finest weekly weekly recruitment newsletter so welcome ham to our podcast my pleasure to to be on here thank you so much hello everybody Uh, thank you so uh, let's start how did you begin your career in the recruiting industry i actually chose the career obey um i'm one of the very few people that decided actually this is exactly what i wanted to do um so when i was at university um as you as you mentioned i studied anthropology at university uh very interesting to uh, to do that type of work my plan was to be an academic um and actually potentially do a phd and continue my studies as a researcher and things of this nature um uh, but over time i realized i didn't want to really work in that type of environment um and and i thought okay i need to actually uh, explore what the commercial world looked like um and at the time i had no clue uh what it is in terms of career direction i'm sure many graduates will be familiar with that um and i was looking around just for opportunities um and i just saw in uh, it became very popular to see um the growth of these technology companies in web 1.0 the first era of the internet this is early okay. 2000s that type of period that's when i first entered um i couldn't program i tried to do some programming uh, let me tell you man it took me a long time to produce a single okay. page of html um okay. i realized at that time um that okay i could try really really hard and i'll still be pretty mediocre as a web developer um but maybe there's another way i could play it um and i could you know be the guy that helps recruit people for those technology companies um and so i ended up uh, working for a um recruitment company in london uh, which was uh, uh helping to recruit you know all these web developers web producers back then that's how we call them um uh, for the web 1.0 era so that's basically how it started for me Okay perfect perfect can you please share me the experience of uh, the developing workshop.io your online recruiting platform yeah so this is a very interesting experiment um this emerged because i ended up doing a lot of startup recruiting myself um okay. uh, you know from 2010 onwards i think um uh, that was made more or less when i was the the recruiter that uh, uh, companies would get in at the 0 to 50 i was uh, i was the 0 to 50 type of recruiter so um a company would raise some money they would have obviously no staff um uh, i would come in and basically recruit the key members of the typically the technical team um okay. and so from that period what happened is i ended up knowing loads of software engineers um inevitably they would come to me and say hey hong let's you know we should do something let's work work on a project um and it was one of these conversations i had with a friend of mine that really sparked my interest because he asked a very interesting question um okay. and his question was hong um so he was a software engineer and he i remember very clearly he said hong why is it that you guys meaning recruit us recruiters always yeah. call me always call me for work i don't want to do anymore um and i said to him firstly uh for, firstly i'm not responsible for your problems according <laughs> is like i cannot be responsible for the entire industry but it was a very interesting question uh why is it um that recruiters always seem to annoy software and technical people uh, how come there is this negative relationship um and it turned out the reason why is because um the information that recruiters have um is historical information um it, we only know um what the person has done in the past um and okay. of course what the person wants to do in the past is not what they may want to do in the future um and i i put it to you in fact uh the, when people are looking for the next job 
it is about the future that they're thinking. They're not wanting to replicate exactly the same job. Um, oh, and yeah. that's what we try to solve with Workshape. We wanted to try and collect what was the future information this person wanted to do? What was the future sentiment that they wanted? And could we match against that? Um, and that was basically uh, how Workshape started. Okay, perfect. In your opinion, as a recruitment professional and as an editor of Recruiting Brain Food, what sets apart exceptional recruiters from the rest? Exceptional recruiters, recruiting is a very interesting discipline, um, Obaid. And the reason why yeah. is because so many different personality types have succeeded at very, very high level. Um, okay. uh, so I've, I've always observed this to say, okay, why is one guy particularly extroverted, excellent salesperson, does a lot of money, does great, fantastic. Then in the next minute, you see another person, equally high performer. They're very quiet. They're very introverted. They're, you know, totally yeah. different personality. Um, yeah. So what is the consistent theme? Um, the consistent theme is I think you have to be true to yourself. Um, so Absolutely. in other words, whatever it is that you have in inside, yeah. whatever yeah. that quality is, you just have to double against that. So don't worry so much about your weaknesses. Understand what your strength is and just make sure you build on your strength. So, for instance, if you're a person that is fantastic on the phone, you're great interacting, you're a charisma type person, okay, that's okay. exactly what you should be doing. Uh, you should be am amplifying all of those traits. Um, but there's more um, ways to be successful in this recruitment business. You could be a very introverted person, but be very highly disciplined, super organized, be able to understand risk analysis. Be, under, uh, be able to understand which businesses are worth working on, which roles are not worth working on. That type of way can also be a huge success as well. So be true to yourself. That's the key to success in recruiting. Absolutely. As an editor of Recruiting Brain Food, would you like to highlight the major recruiting trends in the next coming years? Well, I think we're in the same situation globally. We're, we're pretty comfortable. I'm not comfortable because it's a tough market, but I think we are. We are. We are. Com we have a high confidence level as to what we can say about the recruitment market conditions. Number one, we know that there is a global movement to rationalize processes. So every Absolutely. company yes. out there is looking at it and thinking. Okay, we cannot. What, uh, do we really need to carry 500 people in this department? Can we do it with 350? Every organization, every department, I would say every country is going down this route. Um, now, what does this mean for recruiters? You know what? It means that the, the, the era of 2021 is over, um, where we can no longer rely on companies that were just growing without planning um, and growing without a sense of you know being very very disciplined so the opportunity the the the, the 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 hyper scaling moment i think is over um now what this means for us recruiters is that we have to be very smart in picking the domain that we're in um uh, we have to think uh, as the ceo thinks um of our customers does the CEO uh, estimate that this particular department will grow in future? Or is the CEO thinking, you know what, um, two years down the line, we probably could get rid of this department entirely. Um, and we recruiters have to be very smart to select the domains that we want to operate in. Um, okay. Because we don't, we don't want to be choosing um, a, a domain uh, that ultimately um, doesn't have a long uh, 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 half-life um, in this world. Okay, perfect. So uh, let's talk about employer branding. If we talk about the major companies, the big global companies, they have the internal teams of employer branding with huge budgets allocated to that particular function. If we talk what, how, how an, a medium-sized companies or an SME create an employer brand, in your opinion, yeah, we're actually having this conversation tomorrow. Exactly the same topic. How do you really? do talent attraction, attention? Yeah, for where, where you have no brand, right? Let's say yeah. you're one recruiter working for a 250-person business. Um, yeah. You have no budget. There's no expertise as a person. Now, how do you do it? What are the um, tools a, a company with a very limited budget, limited resources in an uncertain situation, the recession nowadays, how they handle and develop the employer brand? There's, Other than the, the, career fairs and everything. 
No, 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 there's actually a really, uh, the people have been giving me information on this and they've been saying very consistently the same thing. Um, uh, and actually, it is a very positive thing because it says back to the reality of what employer brand is. You have to start Perfect. with the, you have to start basically with the employees you currently have. Um, so the employees you currently, the, the, the workers and colleagues you currently have, they are your best um, employer brand assets um, and okay. they're the ones that you need to mobilize to talk about um, your company. So in other words, you don't need to go and create, you know, a, 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 a movie quality video. You don't need to create all of these assets and, and all these wonderful things. Go and speak to your current team. Go and speak to your, the, the do a survey um, of the people who are currently in the company ask them the question okay um what are the reasons why you think this is a good company to work for um if you were to recommend a friend to work for this company what what, what would be the reason for you to do that um and if you simply collected that information we're talking about doing a survey but let's say we do a zoom call instead and we ask that question to everybody in the company pretty soon you will build up a large volume of content that you could potentially pr promote out there um, okay. because you, you're getting genuine information from the people who are doing the work. Not they, These are not marketing people. These are not recruiters. These are people actually doing the work, and they're telling you, you know what, I, I think people want to work here for this reason. Um, now, of course, they may not say this because maybe it's a tough job or maybe it's, you know, the company isn't in perfect shape. But even if that is the case, that will give you a very good barometer as to where you're at when it comes to EB. Um, if the company is under stress, um, people are not doing well, then probably you need to know about that. Um, and employer branding campaigning is probably not the priority in that type of circumstance. Um, okay. but I, I guess the message is if you're able to ask your current staff um, about what they think about the company that they're currently working for, that is where you start building an employer brand on a budget. Okay. Do you think the employees will give you a uh, honest and candid feedback? Um, I think the employees if, will. If they are working in an owner-driven organization, Hank. In an owner-driven organization, you know, it's an interesting thing to say because depending on how, and also we have different types of sort of communication styles in different, uh, in, in different um, industry sectors. They behave differently. Also, uh, culturally, country-wise, different things happen. One way you can try and do it if you want to make sure you want honest feedback is obviously to anonymize data collection um, and get a sense as to where, where we're at. Um, I would like to think um, that we can move to a situation where people would be happy to give feedback um, and it, they wouldn't be penalized for it. Um, because it's important for the senior people to know how the staff truly are thinking. Um, if I was running a business, I would like to know what the staff are thinking, um, because without that, how do I know I'm getting optimal performance? Um, if the staff are not happy, um, uh, no matter how hard I pressure them, they're not going to be performing at the top level um, because you cannot do things at a long time uh, sustainably if you're unhappy at doing that task it's impossible to produce quality work over a consistent period no matter what the, the task is you know i could be making food for instance um i could be a pizza guy you know, making pizza in a restaurant if i'm unhappy that unhappiness will express itself in the pizza you know it's because people are gonna tell yeah. so you need to understand be trustful of your staff and not kind of worry um, that uh, that you'll hear the wrong thing. As the boss, in fact, you want to be hearing all of these things so that you can go and correct them and put them into place uh, so you have a happier company and then you can push forward um, uh, with, with, with higher performance if you correct some of those unhappiness issues. Perfect. So uh, how do you foresee the role of technology in five to ten years down the line for a recruitment industry? Yeah, I think it's uh, obviously. Um, uh, no, no, not directly. I mean, I think that there will be certainly uh, a real talk. Um, there, there will be technology will make companies smaller overall. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, I think I think we hit probably peak size of company probably in two thousand and twenty-one. Yes. I would say. Okay. Um, okay. This is when 
If you look at all of the U.S. technology companies, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, all of those um, had their highest ever number of employees in 2021. All right, that's when they kept on hiring everyone. That's the highest they've ever had. Since then, what has happened? Multiple layoffs, uh, many thousands of people are taken off the headcount and then continuing to reduce. Um, so I don't think that they'll ever get to the same size again. I think what will happen is companies are now starting to look at, okay, maybe we can use technology in such a way where we can reduce the, uh, the overall human footprint of our organization, but still maintain higher levels of productivity uh, and quality and so on. So uh, what does this mean for us recruiters? It means that ultimately the easier times are over. Um, we will not be directly replaced. You know, there's not going to be a robot walking in that totally replaces a, a human recruiter, uh, but there's probably going to be less recruiters. Um, doing the job. If we had 2 million recruiters, let's say in 2021, globally doing the job full time, um, maybe in 2025, we'll have 1.5 million recruiters doing it full time. Okay. Um, and But that is in alignment with the lower numbers uh, or, or the smaller sizing of, of companies overall. Now, what we should see, I hope, um, is that we'll have many, many more companies as emerging as a result. Maybe there's be smaller, but there'll be more. So in other words, instead of a thousand companies with 10,000 employees each, uh, maybe we'll get 10,000 companies with 1,000 employees each. Um, okay. And the, the, the requirement to deliver recruitment will be will still be there, but it will be different because you're recruiting for a different size of organization. Um, so no technology doesn't replace recruiters. And there's lots of reasons why I think we've been confident there. That's a good uh, news. That's no, a good yeah, news yeah. for us. Yes, you have to be confident, um, but there's also really some very interesting, yeah, we have to understand how um, AI is trained. Um, AI is trained on documented information, um, okay. uh, meaning that someone has written this, this information down and fed it into a computer, uh, right? Um, now, um, I put it to you and anybody listening to this, um, most of the most important conversations that you will have in the recruitment career have, are, are, are never documented. Um, uh, uh, you know, this is the conversation you have with the hiring manager off the record. Okay, uh, yeah, <laughs> seriously, let, let me know uh, why is it exactly that this job is available? Why is it open? Um, uh, no one needs to write anything down there, but he'll then tell you exactly the reason. Um, you speak to a candidate. Okay, Mr. Candidate, um, you are all going to accept this job all the way through. And now suddenly I get the sense that you're deciding to slow down and, you know, I'm not hearing back from you. I get the sense you, you don't want to necessarily go forward in the same way. Um, can you tell me off the record exactly what the situation is? And that person might then share the information. So recruiters have access to undocumented, off-the-record information. Um, that is never going to go into AI. Um, and that is why recruiters, I think, uh, will still be competitive in an AI-enabled world because we have always got access to that type of data. Perfect. Perfect. So... As far as HR Pakistan is concerned, the tech companies hung in Pakistan are facing a lot of difficulties in attracting the tech talent. Can you please highlight the major ways and creative ways so that the tech companies and the software development companies here attract the talent easily? Yeah, it's, you know what? It, I'll be interested to know why. Um, I mean, it's very competitive to hire software engineers in the general case. Um, uh, we, we know a little bit about the software developer psychology, um, and, and maybe it's about leaning against that. Um, I mean, firstly, we, we know the compensation level has to be at, a, at, at the high level to attract the talent because the demand of they the are skills the is there. They are They're the already high. Money-making guys, yeah. So, 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 so the next thing you need to look at is, okay, what do developers care about? They care about team, um, and then they care about the technology. So in other words, it's very, very important. Most modern software development um, is a collaborative uh, production of software. Um, it's not people like separated, uh, you know, and purely typing into a keyboard, producing code without reference to anybody else. Um, it's working in collaboration with others. So companies that understand this um, recognize that um, you need to get the team closer to the candidate um, uh, when they're going through the interview process, you need to show what kind of team members 
um, that this candidate might be actually joining um, or interacting with. That helps hugely to better understand, to, to just lower the risk for that individual to say, you know what, here are the quality people that you'll be joining. Here are the people that you'll be able to learn from. Um, and the third thing is obviously the technology and the, and the problem set. Um, you know, if the technology and the problem set are interesting enough, usually these are things that will be very attractive to candidates. It's very hard to do uh, because, and you shouldn't necessarily do it purely for these reasons, um, because obviously if you're producing software in this industry, that is what you do. You shouldn't necessarily create random things just to attract candidates. Um, but it's one of the ways in which if you could express why this software is interesting and, 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 and important for the industry, underline those things, the, the impact of the code that you, the, you're going to be asking these people to develop, um, that typically helps the candidate visualize their contribution in future to that company. And I think that's uh, that will help make some conversions for you. Perfect. Last question. One valuable piece of advice for talent acquisition fraternity globally? Um, I think it's hugely important um, for recruiters um, and talent acquisition people um, to think about their own network value. Uh, network okay. value meaning, okay, um, what is the absolute um, value of the, the sum of connections and relationships you have? Um, uh, we need to make sure that we are actively contributing and building that network value, particularly with other recruiters. Um, uh, so in other words, um, a, another element of where we might be able to uh, you know, con insulate ourselves from the threat of AI is to be able to access crowd intelligence. So forget about artificial intelligence for the moment. Um, think about crowd intelligence. Um, Can you please elaborate what is crowd intelligence? Crowd intelligence, maybe the term is more, for, more familiar, maybe swarm intelligence. Um, okay. So this is this is the concept that multiple people may be able to produce information and solutions really quickly compared to one person you know, working very, very hard by themselves. Um, so, for instance, you must have a huge network, uh, uh, Obeid. Uh, if you did, yeah. uh, you, you'll be able to activate that. Your net, your network value is very powerful. Your ability to access the crowd intelligence of your network is very powerful um, because you're able to say, okay, guys, I have this situation. What, how would you deal with it? Can you give me a, an example in your past where you've handled it? And then before you know it, you know, 100 people might respond to you and say, okay, here's how I did this back in the past. All of that information is critically uh, important and interesting. Again, it is stuff that AI, I think, struggles to to, to, to deal with. It's a different way of sourcing information. Um, but because you have already built your network, built your network value, you're able to activate that crowd much more effectively than someone who hasn't. Um, and so my advice to, to everyone is to essentially think, can you activate the crowd? Can you build okay. a network so, such that it can help you um, solve problems that you, you, at this point, haven't anticipated or haven't even thought about. Okay. Last question for our viewers. Your secret of success as a recruiting professional. Secret of success. You know what? I don't think there's like any magical formula. Um, it, is, it is just understanding um, probably the one thing in my career that I've been able to do reasonably well is be about six months ahead of everyone else in terms of the uh, economic direction. Um, uh, that's 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 about it. Um, so I'm not particularly talented. I'm not particularly skillful on the phone. I'm not you know any kind of intellectual hero. No. Um, but what I do is think, okay, um, what is the general direction of this industry right now? Um, can I think a little bit further than the next guy? Most people don't think even, even one day ahead. Um, but if you can think three months ahead, six months ahead, where is the general direction? Um, that's going to really help you make the right choices early enough. Um, and oftentimes in recruiting, I think in any other business, um, if you're just ahead of the rest of the market by that period of time, that's going to that's gonna suit you okay. Perfect. Thank you so much, Hank, for your time. Uh, and it's a pleasure. Uh, uh, and we have learned a lot. I have learned a lot from your valued observations. And thank you. And for viewers, hope you enjoyed our, uh, his journey and his valued observations.